I have the pleasure to introduce to you now uh, one of our gold sponsors and a sponsor that's helped make this particular event uh, happen many times here in Singapore. Stefan Carlin is the Regional Chief Executive Officer and President for Asia Pacific Panalpina. And he comes in with what I heard of and have seen innovative strategies on again moving goods into markets. And one of the things that as supply chain practitioners, as logistics and manufacturing practitioners we do, is make sure to move products, open up new doors, open up new ways for marketing and sales to achieve their goals. And so Panopina helps to bring that to life and I'm sure we're gonna hear more about that. So please welcome Stefan to the stage. Well, good morning everybody and um, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address a few things about supply chain innovation and actually um, talk a little bit about sort of the company Panalpina, who we are, one of the big four. Not too big, but also not too small. But certainly I would like to address a few extracts of the study where Panalpina has participated. It's a, th a third party logistics study where we have been going through several years already because we want to know and understand what are the trends. We want to understand from the shippers what do you need and how can we part of it of that trend going forward. So here is basically, as I mentioned, the short introduction on, on where we're going to be heading at today in the 30 minutes. I'm also going to be talking about a study I, I think has been mentioned by the previous speakers already. It's about network optimization, new dynamics in the market. How can we be different tomorrow? How can we do things different tomorrow? And obviously, what part can Panalpina play in this? So a little bit about Panalpina. We are, as I said, we are a company, um, 500 offices, um, over 80, 80 countries, 15,000 employees. Um, as I mentioned, one of the big fours, we have 6.6 .6 million, as you can see the numbers there. We, the volumes that we're moving are actually increasing. We are highly dependent or high dependency on air freight, but obviously also growing on the ocean freight over those years. Panalpina over the years has also expanded in logistics and we're managing today on behalf of our customers, but also through our tra um, transit warehouses, about 1.2 million square meters. Um, Panalpina has a new CEO, has taken office first of June this year, and obviously great to have him on board as a true professional. Where does Panalpina make the money? Obviously, if you look at here, we have divided the group into three regions. Uh, you see Europe, Americas, and Asia. You see the percentages of where we're making, that is because of um, a lot of our customers um, are deciding basically um, in other regions, whereas we are executing from here. That is obviously over the years, that's going to change. We see that growth already today because more decisions are being taken in this part of the world, but also, because of other markets are currently um, you know, going through some turmoils and that's why I think the growth is really gonna be in Asia. Here you see the dependencies that we have on the different products. What do we actually wanna achieve as Panalpina? We wanna actually create value for you. We don't wanna just be there a cost item as was mentioned before. We actually want to make sure that we are creating a value for yourself, for your supply chain. That's our aim and obviously we want to make sure that our long-term goal is matching yours. Panalpina is an asset-like company. We continue to be that, but we also want to make sure what kind of risk can we take on on behalf of yourself because we see a trend that a lot of customers, they start also to reduce or wanting to reuse their fixed asset to be more um, flexible when it comes to volume trends. The success factors that we see as Panalpina, they're truly in, in those components that you see on the slides. One is, and I'm sure our competitors are talking about the same, is the global network. Yes, we think global, but we have to act local. It's important that we have, in all of the region, all of the stations, we have the same qualified people on board, that we train them. We want them to be experts in the industry verticals. We don't want them to be generalists. We want that when you talk to us, that you have somebody out there that is knowledgeable about it, your business, and that can give, again, greater value for yourself call it in the procurement side, but certainly also the process, the optimization, everything is about productivity. How can we do that? 
how does our IT platform have to develop in order to succeed in this one? And last but not least, a very important topic for, for us at Palampina, and I'm sure for yourself as well, is about compliance. We do believe that Palampina has set the standard in the logistics market when it comes to compliance. I think we have our compliance program, we have our ethical standards as everybody in this company, all the 15,000 people are living up to. Enough about Palampina. Let me talk, get you through a little bit about the study that we have been doing. For 17 years, the third party logistics study has been conducted. Panalpina has been part of it together with other sponsors that made it happen. And what do we want to do with this? What is the, the goal of the whole study? The goal is to understand where are we today, and what are the expectations going forward, and how do we as 3PLs have to diversify ourselves, how do we have to change ourselves to be able to help you to meet your ambitious growth targets, as well as how can we support and also grow as a company with this. The study has basically been originating more in the, in the US and North America, in the Americas as such. It's obviously where mature, more mature markets in terms of the logistics are, have expanded over Europe and finally over to Asia. It obviously takes, we have tried to cover in this study a variety of shippers from all over the world to see what the trends are, to be able to compare region by region, to see what are the similarities, what is something that runs well in one, potentially can be adopted to another region. But it was not only a one single or sided view that we have taken in this study. What has also been done is obviously we wanted to know where are the three PLs, what role are they playing, what is their contribution to this. In addition to that, in order not to be dependent on one um, single uh, industry verticals, what we have done is we have also looked into trying to cover as many different industry verticals to see again, are there similarities between one industry vertical versus another. Certainly not all of them have the same dynamics, but there's certainly some learnings from one to another that can be applied. Now, the 3PL market, actually good news. I mean, for the big ones maybe, you know, there's more consolidation going on. I think shippers have also realized to manage a 3PL or number of 3PLs is a costly exercise. It's a time-consuming exercise. So actually, it's also a little bit of a transformation. There's more consolidation that is going on. On the other side, insourcing has, is not on the top of the list today because obviously some, they, some of the shippers, they see their core business is not in logistics. We rather prefer to concentrate on our core business and let somebody else help us to do that. But then again, there are some of the, of the shippers that, say, that are saying, hey, this is key for us, this is our core business, I want to do it myself. On the other side, the increase of the services that are being outsourced to 3PLs is actually increasing. We'll come to a slide in a minute where we show basically also, you know, the transactional part, the commoditized services, but it's more about, and as I mentioned before, it's about value add. How can we create value add to you? So actually, from our side, from a 3PL side, we need to think ahead. We need to see what value added services can we offer to make your life more easy. You see here the spending, good news again for, uh, for the 3PL in APAC. In Asia, there was more spending anticipated. We're seeing here a graph that's basically referring to 210 to 11. The 212 numbers at the time when the study was conducted were not yet available, but certainly was also going in the same direction. So the outsourcing trend continues, but not everybody's convinced. So we see here the positive trend, you see there's a big development since 2008 up to 2012. But some of the shippers, as, as I mentioned before, they don't want to let loose about the logistics. They have a belief, and probably they're right, where they're saying, I, need, I know better my logistics. I know better my supply chain. I don't want to give this out of my hands. I want to continue controlling it. Some of them probably have made bad experience, and that's why the respond some of the respondents came back and saying, hey, all these nice cost saving that you have proposed to me, they have not materialized. So that's why they stay, okay, some of them, they want to continue to do it themselves. Outsourcing is too important for us, so we cannot do it, we need to do it ourselves. As well as more, some of the 3PLs actually have great 
uh, three, um, logistics experts in their own ranks that can actually steer and be more flexible when it comes to adjusting their own um, supply chains. So obviously we see there's a high satisfaction. We, say, we said before there's still a lot of room for improvement as well. But I think one point that I want to highlight here, and that these are the logistics cost reduction. The shippers that have responded, and we're talking about 1,510, they came back and said 15% of their costs have been reduced by outsourcing their logistics to a 3PL. I think that's enormous. I mean, 15%, think about you spend it you have today. Obviously, I can't give you a guarantee today, I, you know, we can match that, but I think it's certainly a trend. There is a benefit, there is a value, which comes down to the dollar money, that they are being saved for it. Logistics, fixed assets, we mentioned that before. Some shippers that have a tendency in the past, they have been acquiring their own warehouses. Now services are fluctuating, market dynamics are changing, new markets are being opened. Not all the shippers are ready and interested in investing into fixed assets. So it's always also where 3PL is coming in at times and by being able to consolidate different shippers, different volumes into a, an asset to be able to optimize and still create and generate a benefit for the shipper. The satisfaction rate on the full fulfillment and the accuracy has also increased. Now I mentioned beforehand, you know, there is certain services that are being offered, they're being offered over time to many of the customers, and they have started to become like a commodity, commoditized. Everybody can offer that. What is really the value add? Some shippers there, they're going straight to carries, you know, because they believe they get a better, um, better value for the money. Now, obviously, that had led 3PLs to think, what can we do different? And if you can see here, this is a bit what 3PLs are offering today, and what today is also being purchased from the shippers from yourself. There's obviously a big gap on what 3PLs are offering today. But I think that goes in the right direction because going forward again, if we are 3PLs, if you want to create value to yourself, we need to go into development. We need to develop platforms, IT platforms. We need to develop into people. We need to develop new services in order that our portfolio, that what we are going to be offering is wider and gives you the better choice to choose from. And I think this shows exactly in the study that yes, there is there, the services that are being offered, they are there, there's more, so there's also more opportunity for shippers to buy new services in. Now the relationship, I think it's key for any, any business two parties are doing together is about the relationship. It's no more about only customer service supplier. It's more about partnership, and that's certainly what we are aiming at Palampina, is about partnership. How can we go together the next step? Because any partnership, any development that requires certainly investments. So if there's in um, a win-win situation, is there in uh, something to basically gain for both sides? I think it makes it easier to take a partnership to the next level. So here again you see what are the perception, how are the shippers rating themselves in terms of the relationship they have with the 3PL, and what is the perception? You can see that there's a positive trend. I mean, one of the key factors is openness. If you want to make a partnership working, then we've got to be open to each other. We've got to be open and sharing information. Yes, I know they're confidential, but certainly you should be able to trust your 3PL that he's treating the information that you're giving in a confidential way and able to work on it to create, again, the value for yourself. Open communication. The shipper, they want to know, obviously, what is coming up. They don't want to be caught by surprise. A shipment is delayed. Manpower is changing. My key contact is gone. I think that's, again, a proactive approach that a 3PL has to, has to take in order to, to develop the partnership further. So we see there, there's a positive development. If you look at the numbers in brackets there, the previous year's figures in 211 and then 212, it is there, but still there is a discrepancy in the belief and the way it is being rated. The shippers believe it's much better than, or slightly better than what the three PLs are believing. The gain sharing, I mentioned it beforehand, any investment that comes forward, you know, be that in people, be that in, in other monetary terms, obviously it's got to be somewhere a win-win situation. There's again the belief that and if you can see actually the development from the shipper side, the way they perceive it, they're less interested in, in doing this gain sharing. Of 
course, one can understand, you know, the markets are tough out there, so obviously one needs to protect bottom line, but also has to, to do with the fact that it is important to take it a step further. Then the flexibility to be able to manage those relationships. There's also, again, a belief the shippers may say they're not ready for this development yet. Um, whereas on the other side, probably a bit selfish, probably a bit arrogant, on the three belt, yes, we're ready, we can do everything. That's obviously also not the case. I think it has to be looked at case by case. Governance models have to be put in place. Relationships have to be built over different levels in order that the escalation is working well, that a problem doesn't become a problem, can be put out the fire in an early stage. Here we see the perception again that the shippers have from the three PLs, which goes in line with the last item on the previous slide, is basically there's a discrepancy or what shippers believe um, the three PLs to be ready for and vice versa. Now, as the logistics market is maturing, obviously it's becoming more challenging. More challenging for the shipper on the one side because they want to di differentiate themselves from their competitors in the market. They have to really look into their supply chain. What can I do Some substantially different that gives me another edge over my competitors? Now the question comes, who's driving these initiatives? Who's coming up with them? Actually, here's a bit balance between shipper and 3PLs. Consultants, actually interesting enough, you know, there's a lot of consultants that are today being engaged to look at what one does, to consult in how to do it better, and then leave up the implementation mainly to the shippers or, or the 3PL. So actually the, the innovation, the drivers for innovation, for me was an interesting thing to see is actually only 12%. Now put that in a perspective, and nothing against all consultants potentially in here, look, put that in perspective to to the, the dollar amount they're being spent on consultancy. Obviously, this is also part of a, today's service portfolio that a 3PL is offering or should be offering to yourself. Talking about on the other side of the slide, the funding all comes back down to the money. The margins have drastically decreased over the years. Uh, you can see uh, carriers, are, they're losing their shirts. You know, they need to be innovative. 3PLs need to be innovative. And actually here, some of the shippers, and I, also 49% for me is a rather high percentage, that are basically saying, hey, um, I'm ready to do gain sharing on the one side, but also I'm ready to support any funding, any financial support initially to make it happen. Other business models are additional business, which is also, the, also obviously depending on where you're trading today, what is the potential for you to grow. And the other one is obviously a performance bonus. Now, when we talk about what are the drivers really for supply chain innovation, you know, and I'm going to pick a couple of them and, and go a bit more into details. Relationship and trust, I think I've managed, or I mentioned that several times now. I think it's very key, it's very important. I think if we want to really take it to a different level and not only being on the supplier customer, it's all about trust. And how do we build trust? Open communication, knowing each other, being able to commit to something and stick to this. Um, the funding is one, the technology is another one, social media are developing, we cannot ignore them. We have to play in that field. Everybody's using their smartphones today, they want to have opportunities or solutions where you can track a shipment potential over a smartphone. So I think these are developments we cannot avoid. They are going to be part of our life. The new generation, they're going to be working with that. And actually, this is where we need to respond to them. Then the cultural collaborative continuous improvements. Obviously, certainly over the processes, you want to see uh, how does a service that I'm getting today, how is it going to be improved? Certainly, there's always, if you move from a cargo from A to B, there's always a certain risk. Be that now the risk to the cargo exposed, to the process, to your business. You want to make sure that you're getting, again, the value for the money that you're spending over time that you see these improvements. Operational excellence, I think, is key. It's key that, that really to work on to make sure that, you know, what you actually do, what basically we're providing as a service meets or exceeds your expectation. And last but not least, and I think it's very dear to my heart, and I was mentioned also beforehand, the talents. We have to have the right people in front of each other. I think certainly from a logistics perspective in our industry, I um, wouldn't say it's a shortage, but it's difficult times to get to, um, to have access to good people. 
think this is the right thing. What we, for instance, as Palpino, are investing on, on improving the bench strength, working to, with universities to get this level up, to get this um, uh, talent into the company, to be able to have that service, to have a, a, a responsible counterpart on the other side when talking to shippers. And I think that is key. Then the understanding is easier. Talking the same language can take it to the next level. Is innovation good enough? Not anymore. I think, as stated here by, by John Demdahl from, from Cisco, obviously, this is what I have to expect from my 3PL, that they come up with innovation. But is that good enough anymore? No. That's the expectation that you all have. But it's now about disruptive innovation, something to do completely different, that is really going to be a game changer, that sets, is it a new product, is it a new service, is it something completely different than what you have been doing or what has been offered in the market in the past. So there's something that's the next level where we have to really look into it. Again, to be able to go through this, the prerequisite is again, trust, relationship, communication. Without this, it's obvious that the customer, shipper, yourself, you wouldn't share your confidential information. You wouldn't put your business at risk because obviously supply chain is key to your business. You want to get your cargo to the market in time, your services um, to your customers in time. So obviously this is a joint approach. I think it's a, it's a next level where we want to go into, to look into it, how can we really think outside the box. Network optimization. It has mentioned beforehand, and I'm probably not going to expand for too long, I think has been well addressed, to look at, and also in, in our company, that what we do is to look into it, you know, what can be do, done different? How can we help a customer to potentially reroute its, its products through a completely different channel, through a completely different country, and trying to get an advantage position out of it? Again, Things that are working don't break them, but I think at times it's really critical to look into it, to put all those numbers, all these volumes that you're shipping, allow them to be worked on, allow them, us or somebody else, you know, to look into it. How can I basically look at the new center of gravity for my distribution? Is it where it is today? It's also to look at what I'm doing today, is it still the right thing? The market is changing so fast. There's a lot of regulatory, um, issues out there that need to be considered and that can give you a, co a cost advantage on the one side, also to be faster to the market on the other side. So basically, Palpina has been confronted with one of his customers that was looking for it, hey, I'm doing a business today. And this particular case was, you may say, simple, out of China into the Australian market, having the potential to look into new markets. So what we have been doing together, obviously, identify first of all, what are your key objectives? So basically we're talking about the warehousing cost. has been heavy in the warehousing cost, so the customer wanted to reduce them. The total cost of freight, also to look at how fast from the distribution center you may going to propose to me, how fast can I be to the market in the future, and what is going to be my cost. Then obviously the availability of the stock in the warehouse, and for the customers, how fast can I get my product out of the new hub. Then the cash flow, certainly very important, especially when, you know, in today's where Payment terms are becoming longer on the one side. Carriers are struggling. They're wanting their money earlier. So I think that's a combination. How do we deal best with this? And then reduce the inventory holding cost. Anything that is in the warehouse doesn't usually generate money other than probably for the warehouse provider, but not for yourself because you want to get the, the cargo out to your customers so I can pay your bill. So through this, Palpin has basically looked into the different um, items. You know, we looked at um, the cost comparison, the different scenarios which we have been evaluating. We have been looking at inventory and lead times. And then we have also looked at the different cost blocks that obviously are there in a the complete supply chain. We have looked into it, okay, what are the components and how will they be influenced if we look at one or the other scenarios. Again, looking at the decision uh, making factors that the customer put forward, that this is key for them. So based on this, we have come up with something that was, for the customer, new for us, it was also new because we didn't expect the study to come out in such a way with a warehouse in a completely different country, which doesn't touch, doesn't need the product today, be potentially a future market for the customer as well. So we have been looking into this and we came up and, and basically today, 
what they, uh, Palampin is doing has opened an office, or an office meaning a warehouse, for this customer um, to operate and ha handle their products through that warehouse. There is a, a volume of 5,000 TUs, may not be huge, but that's, that's something that we start on with this customer, certainly big potential for further expansion. Plus, the savings were achieved, which was obviously very important for the customer on the one side on the total cost that we have, but certainly have also helped them to reduce fixed costs in the assets. So basically some of the, the items that we have mentioned beforehand which are important and I think where we want to value, uh, add the value to the customer. And I think we have achieved that. Um, you can see in the first option, um, all of them are green, the overall cost, the cost stability. Obviously, a flexible cost for the customer is able to to price its product better and more easy to the market because the, the, the big blocks of cost, you know, the fixed costs are no longer there or to a, certainly to a big extent reduced. Then the supplier impact, obviously not to be neglected because suppliers are playing an important role where they have to feed into, with whom they have to work for. The platform that is being offered and used for, is it user friendly? How fast can it be implemented? The consolidation different orders into one location, from there then to split out according to the orders. And the lead time to Australia, obviously, in this particular case, but also into new markets. So I think basically what I'm, to sum up again, is, is about all these innovations, and I, I think very well um, also described and the outcome of the study is um, we need to work together. I think um, shippers and uh, and um, three PLs, there's still room for improvement in the perception that one has from the other, whereas one is probably believes on a higher level than another one. So I think that is certainly a gap that needs to be narrowed. To work on this, to work on the, on the open communication and the trust. And I think the markets out there, they're challenging. The carriers, they're suffering. We're all suffering, I think, from the depression, but I think there's room for growth. There is, if we go into that with innovations, looking at those, but also looking at really do something different tomorrow. Something that we have not practiced in the past that is really going to be a deal breaker and helps you to advance. I think that's also something which um, Panalpino would want to be part of it. And I think all the three PLs that are participating here and they're out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. I'm going to ask if there's one question out there. Sorry. Uh, you talked about uh, disruptive innovation. Any such uh, uh, disruptive innovation on, uh, in the plan from your company? Sir, can you come again? I'm talking. You talked about disruptive innovation, something which will change the, games of, uh, change the rules of the game, right? Right. So any such uh, disruptive innovation uh, in the offing from your company? So, I mean, that we're working on, I think it's... Um, not now to be specific on a particular customer because I think you, you appreciate the confidentiality that we're doing on this, but I think it's really on, on through, you may call it, you know, um, the network optimization in, in something that really look at completely different markets, routes, completely different mode of transport, completely different um, application that we are doing basically that we know that in the market is such a no practice. So I think it's... Um, so obviously, as I said, you know, confidentiality, we can certainly talk and take it offline, but I think this is something there. Um, it's in the development. It's in the way that we are providing data to the customer, allows them to do it different. Now, um, I think these are, the, are basically the drivers. Now, more in detail at this stage probably cannot really go, but we can certainly take this offline. Thank you again. Thank you. So we've heard about costs, that supply chain is more than costs. It's important to connect with strategy. It's critical to have information. Greg from Unilever talked about how demand and actually sharing, uh, thinking locally was critical to how Unilever could deliver better results to its consumers. Andre from Dell talked about how sh having the supply chain couldn't simply succeed with a simple demand signal. It needed to actually know what was happening in China, the environment, the people, the decisions, and what the consumers needed. And then, thank you, Stefan, for presenting about Panalpina's uh, methodology in terms of innovation and thinking outside the box and being able to, to have a solution that worked when 
the shipper and the 3PL shared more information together. So we've heard these key themes of more than just costs, being able to, to connect with strategy, as well as sharing information and trusting to share information across the silos that exist in business, not just within inside the supply chain, but also beyond in terms of marketing and sales. And so I want us to, before we go into the break, just keep these common themes in mind. And also at National University of Singapore, I would do you a disservice if I didn't mention that we have the executive education and also MBA program so that you can come in and hear about leveraging strategy, delivering information better. And one of my colleagues from the Logistics Institute for Asia Pacific is here. Uh, we also focus on that level of strategy so that these questions that Dell and Unilever, Panalpina are answering and also struggling with and looking forward to the future, we discuss in an environment where you can challenge each other and take it forward. Without further, I'd like to bring Adeline up to the stage to share about the break and other information that, for you. Thank you. <laughs>